Well, hello, that's me again. Today is August 24th, 2024. It is Saturday, and those, to those people who are having a good weekend, lucky for you. And um, uh, let's start with uh, uh, some like memory lane, go, uh, going down the memory lane. And what I'm about to talk today is a very sensitive topic, but it has to be brought up, and actually it was brought up. But let's start with uh, this thing. Uh, Russia uh, m marked yesterday the 81st anniversary of the Battle of Kursk. So here is the map of the Battle of Kursk. And um, uh, this is the map from the, up to the uh, August 1st, 1943. But in reality, Battle of Kursk lasted from July 5th. Uh, 1943 through August 23 uh, of um, 1943. It was a cataclysmic event and uh, many people sometimes do not understand what is going on in terms of their numbers and uh, whatever the statistics is presented primarily by the Western uh, so-called historiography. Uh, I want to immediately forestall any kind of questions that uh, most of what is published there in the Western press about Kursk battle and even earlier earlier work on Kursk. Uh, I believe it was 2001 when David Glantz and Jonathan House wrote the piece on this. It was it's suffered tremendously still from some uh, absolutely crazy numbers presented by the Wehrmacht. I mean, they were the guys who are, were writing fairy tales, you know, about how sophisticated they were, but somehow they lost the war. I mean, so they, you know, and uh, Western historiography was added primarily 99% of it, of rewriting it non-stop. But reality, of course, was uh, a catastrophic uh, defeat of uh, uh, Wehrmacht and Axis forces. It was the largest tank battle. And uh, we will start, uh, let me show you what actually uh, have transpired that in uh, then um, when you look at the history, so to speak, uh, of the question, which is, of course, the, uh, I mean, how can I even use any more uh, those epithets, so to speak, and those, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of hyperbole to uh, describe it. But Kursk battle, if you look attentively at the map, was not just this famous uh, attack of the uh, best Germany the Wehrmacht ever had, which of course have been uh, Manstein, Walter Model, Kluge, you know, all, all people of the Hoth, you know, the, the greatest and the best uh, of uh, uh, them who try to break, you know, snip of this, uh, as you can see yourself, um, uh, uh, bulge, which essentially that it was. Russians called it the uh, Ark of, uh, uh, of Fire. And uh, you will see yourself and you look attentively at what they call counter-offensive, which is actually wrong. July 12th through August 23rd, it wasn't the counter-offensive. The Kursk battle consisted of the three separate operations. It consisted of the Kursk strategic defensive operation, which is the f produced of what I will be talking about in a minute. Famous uh, tank battles, including cataclysmic event near Prokhorovka. And of course, it consist, uh, consisted of two counter-offensive strategic operations. One which, of course, was the... Um, uh, 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 Operation Romancev and Operation Kutuzov, which, as you can see uh, yourself on this map, uh, liberated a tremendous number of the uh, uh, territory of Russia, obviously the Soviet Union at that time, which was, of course, the belgorod Kharkov uh, Operation and uh, uh, Bransk Operation and uh, um, Ariol, pardon me, uh, Operation. And when you look attentively at what have been, has been achieved, I deliberately highlighted in yellow the uh, scale here, which is uh, in, in miles, it's, you can see yourself what 40 miles looks like. But the most important thing was the catastrophic losses inflicted on uh, Axis forces. And so, as always, it all started to be rewritten, including the famous cataclysmic event at the uh, what is called Battle of Prokhorovka. 
And for some reason, and uh, that's what you know, Western historiography does it. They pull out the simple the, the, the date, single date of the famous 12th uh, of July, where the Fifth Guards Army of Pavel Rotmistrov clashed with the Manstein, Manstein's um, main force around. Uh, uh, village of Prokhorovka, which uh, uh, involved uh, 1,200 tanks and just enormous amount, thousands of airplanes fighting up there, in, you know, in the air. So it, it was just cataclysmic. People literally say that we had our ears bleeding from the sound of it because this was uh, something, uh, I mean, absolutely catastrophic. But, but, reality, of course, was that uh, practically all numbers, especially which are provided in Wikipedia, in, especially in terms of losses, they provide like in accordance to this German guy, in accordance to this uh, British guy, in accordance to this and that. I mean, they are all crap. The only real numbers of Russian losses throughout this almost two months, well, roughly two months, more, more like months and a half, uh, operation you can find the, from uh, only author authoritative. Um, uh, source, which is of course Krivashev and his group, and it is obviously, as you can say yourself, these are three operations from Kursk strategic defensive operation to operation of the uh, uh, Belgorod Kharkov and Ariol operation, and uh, you will see yourself that the dramatic discrepancy, especially in terms of how it was uh, presented in the Western historiography, and then of course we have the uh, famous Prokhorovka event. This is what actually Russian archives tell, they completely debunk all this garbage which Wehrmacht produced because it was always rewriting on the history. What do you expect from Nazis? Hello. And so here it is. For example, the tank battle termination. It's uh, when the famous clash at Prokhorovka happened. And what people do not understand, it wasn't just one uh, off event in one day. The actual battle of Prokhorovka lasted from 11th of July through 16th of July. So it was a five day long battle and uh, it's simply just uh, uh, July 12th was a, you know, the biggest event, but it was for five days. And here is what uh, actually Russian archives tell you. On both sides, up to 1,200 tanks and self-propelled guns participating in the Battle of Prokhorovka. The losses of the Soviet troops, according to domestic research, then amounted to 500 tanks out of 800 vehicles participating in the battles. This is 60% of the original composition. The German lost 300 tanks out of 400. On July 12th alone, the Nazis lost some 70 tanks. Thus, the enemy lost its striking power and the Soviet command had the necessary reserves uh, in in reserve, the Germans did not go further. The Battle of Prokhorovka was an unconditional victory for the Red Army. And actually, well, of course, this small little Mr. Marshal Vasilevsky, of course, a legendary guy who says that from the report of the representatives, what he said of the general, well, they called command, uh, general command headquarters, it was called Stavka. Yesterday, I personally observed the tank uh, um, a tank battle southwest of Prokhorovka between our 18th and 29th corps with more than 200 enemy tanks in a counterattack. At the same time, hundreds of guns and all of the uh, rocket launchers, Katyusha, uh, we had uh, took part in the battle. Uh, as a result, the entire battlefield was littered with burning Ger German and Russian tanks for an hour. And it was already stated on July 14th, which tells you basically that it was a protracted event. So Germans love and Western uh, 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 historiography loves to take out July 12th, where the Russians sustained the largest losses, which is true. Uh, Fifth Guards Army of Pavel Rotmistrov, which went to met uh, uh, Germans on July 12th, uh, actually sustained uh, well, much larger losses than uh, obviously Germans. But the problem is, Germans, what they love to do, for example, uh, whatever they have been able to recover for, from the battlefield, the knocked out tanks, they didn't even uh, put them into the uh, statistics 
characteristics of the, uh, their losses. And guess what? This is the same way as they were calculating the combat score of the Luftwaffe. If it was the common uh, victory, for example, five people sh participate in shooting down a single plane, guess what? Each of them has been assigned the personal victory. So this is a very funny, you know, Wehrmacht statistics, Nazi statistic, uh, which is propaganda. But the result was a catastrophe at Kursk for uh, Germans and uh, Axis forces. And of course, then of course, famous uh, BS, which somebody from US Army heard after the war that allegedly Manstein stated that we started to transfer our best SS Panzer divisions uh, and the <coughs> pardon me, operation was called off because uh, allies uh, landed in Sicily. This is absolute garbage. Those SS divisions uh, uh, <coughs> have been transferred to the Mews front near Rostov, which was another cataclysmic event where, where uh, Red Army uh, uh, attacking and essentially launching the offensive, which results, uh, resulted eventually in the liberation of the old southern part of Russia, uh, of the Soviet Union. And of course, the Das Reich uh, transferred the SS Panzer Division, transferred uh, all of its heavy equipment to those two divisions, which have been uh, transferred to the Mios Front. And they have been moved because of the heavy losses into the called Garrison. Uh, garrison uh, um, uh, duties in Italy without any equipment. Guess what they were doing there? Correct. They were hunting Jews. The first thing they did when they have been transferred to Italy, northern Italy, no less, not close to Sicily. Uh, and well, yeah, the first thing they did, they executed 49 Jewish people. So there you go. That's everything you need to know about it. And as the result, of course, we have this complete, I mean, you know, how to put it, uh, it's a bad hurt if you wish, but, but all these events, uh, which with the incursion in Kursk, which is being dealt with, we will talk about it, finally created in Russia, even on the top, the ability to speak in the broad sides and call it as it is. And suddenly, even those uh, people from uh, Valdai, you know, uber liberal, pro, well, largely pro Western uh, so called think tank, I mean, and most of them are absolutely literate, really, in real uh, applied geopolitics, they started to follow what Irina Alksnis, chief editor of RIA News, uh, posted, uh, uh, well, wrote uh, actually for the uh, 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 anniversary uh, of the Kursk battle and um, here it is i mean she wrote about it that yesterday that the battle of Kursk has been going on for nine decades august 23 marks the anniversary of the end of the battle of kursk until recently those events seemed infinitely distant and right now we are experiencing their repetition and the repetition is eerie similar invaders with nazi symbols on their uniforms heavy battles for every meter of land and the same names appear in reports from the front as then and yeah she is uh, obviously referring to the Das Reich uh, and uh, uh, Totenkopf uh, uh, SS division you know insignia they are carrying this and then suddenly Mr. Bardachov comes up in RT yesterday and he speaks and what also Irina Alskni spe uh, speaks about and what I'm uh, talking about for years now. Here's why Russia won't talk to Ukraine. Kiev's leadership isn't acting in the, rest, in the interest of its own people. Instead, it serves Washington's agenda and those of its closest allies. Well, he gives some, you know, geopolitical overview of things. And then he finally comes down to what I'm talking about. Much depends on the national culture, I explaining the, what is going on in the world and what is happening between West and Russia. Americans or Western Europeans, because of their inherent racism, are capable of killing civilians en masse if they have to. In Russia, customs are different, especially when it comes to our immediate neighborhood. And guess what? That is why. For example, when he talks about racism, which I'm uh, talking about, is the fact that West was al always considered Russian subhumans. In the eyes of Washington elite, for example, I, being ethnic Russian, is a subhuman. The Russians 
are subhumans for people. Granted that Washington and London are highly uncultured and very badly educated people, but what they go through in those Ivy League, uh, you know, uh, humanities degree, so-called degree meals, which prepare, which is not even elite, it's a pretty much, you know, the degree meals, okay? So they, the only thing is they are ideologically brainwashed and instilled. It's a repetition of the same cycle of the racial superiority and cultural superiority over everybody else. Obviously the fact that they, if they will be uh, paraded in Russia, around Russian culture, they will feel immediately, well, inferior. And when you look at the uh, basically what is uh, uh, was happening for centuries, you will begin to understand why it was all possible and why today United States and London support what is outright Nazi regime. Because in the eyes of those people in London and in Washington DC, majority of them view Russians as subhumans. That is why they don't don't care about, I mean, how many children are killed. They don't care how many women are raped by their, you know, SOBs, which is, of course, you know, Kiev regime. And this is what finally got to the point that whole Russian nation, overwhelming majority of it, understands it. It has been internalized, and this is how it all came down to what actually even Mr. Putin wrote in his ordinance. Well, he didn't write it, he signed it, uh, for example, of allowing the best people of the West trying to escape what is turning out to be the totalitarian state with the fascist tendencies. United Kingdom, for example, it's not a democracy, it's a totalitarian state. They are getting into the 1984 and they will be uploading in 10 years probably about those 25 additional grams of chocolate which will be distributed to their pretty much pauper population. And, but what, what can you do about it? Well, there you go. You instill the feeling of the racial superiority. And fact is, Obviously, I immediately want to forestall. I can sense already many people running immediately to the comment sections and saying, "No, I don't, you know, feel, you know, uh, you know, racially superior and don't view Russians as subhumans." I know many of you don't believe me. I'll just give you an example. There are many people in the West who are decent, hardworking people with the decent attitudes towards life. That is why, for example, this ordinance writes about that it's neoliberal liberalism which killed the West. Liberalism, the classic liberalism, the enlightened liberalism didn't kill the West. This was neoliberalism or whatever passes under, his, under this term which uh, killed it. But look at this. Many people, famous uh, Mr. Janssen of, uh, from Holland. You know what he did? He's a farmer. It was five years ago and it went viral. You see this? Here's the guy, he put his tractor and his, uh, actually whatever the thingy, uh, carriage, and look at this. Russia stopped Hitler, not America. 26 million Russians died, and he put it at the highway in uh, Netherlands. Then he talks about, here it is. Russia stop Napoleon, Russia stop Hitler, Russia please stop America. This was five years ago, and guess what? People already then, many Europeans understood what their predicament and they already knew what was uh, well, going to happen to them. And it's happening right now as we speak. There are the last vestiges of the real freedom of what actually is prescribed, so to speak, in the you know, freedom of consciousness, freedom of choice by classic liberalism. It turned into complete, I mean, mayhem and nightmare. And this is what is happening. They also rewrite history nonstop, especially the history of the World War II. But if we talk about the Kursk battle and how it ended uh, 81 years ago yesterday, uh, there was nothing even remotely uh, comparable with what happened at the Kursk Balch in 1943, in July and August 1943, in terms of the scale of operations by Western allies. Not even close. And that's what is, will, will continue to happen after that when the Red Army started its non-stop drive 
to Berlin. And Kursk battle was if Stalingrad. Actually, battle of, of Moscow in 1941, already then Russians and Soviet people knew that uh, we can resist. In uh, After the end of Stalingrad battle, everybody knew that Soviet Union will not lose the war and it's going most likely win. That after Kursk, everybody knew in Soviet Union that the drive on Berlin was on and that Soviet Union will be able to demolish Nazi Germany and its allies. This was the pivotal historic moment in World War II, all of it. And so they want to deny it and they will continue to deny it and they will deny it precisely because most of them, uh, and I know this for a fact, view Russians as subhumans and subhumans are not allowed to be better. But Russians are better at war, they are actually best in the world. And their military history, for example, of the United States, with all deepest respect to heroism and courage and, you know, dedication of American veterans and American U.S. Navy and, uh, you know, Eisenhower troops and all that. But still, if you look attentively at the military history of Russia, it dwarfs anything out there. And uh, so, speaking of Kursk, we can go and take a look at the... Um, what is happening right now? Uh, as you can see yourself, today, August 24, or oh, as absolute record, 2,483 wiped out of the order of battle for Ukraine, 10 tanks and APCs, 35 armored vehicles, 28 artillery and mortars, uh, you know, so it just continues. Uh, yesterday there were truckload of the, uh, all kinds of the, um, uh, MLRS, multi-launch rocket uh, systems uh, 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 annihilated and well, well here's yet another one another one bites the dust. This is uh, uh, another Abrams which have been uh, killed there. Now they stick the reactive armor all over all those Abramses, but it, it's not going to help. Uh, as I already stated, there is nothing which they can do, uh, honestly, in terms of armor, which is going to help. I mean, you cannot withstand uh, latest Russian, well, how, how to put it, like, latest. It's not really that latest, but uh, against Cornet, there's no chance, you know, and there are other anti-ATGMs, anti-tank guided missiles, and of course, uh, great Russian tanks, which are capable to handle anything which West will throw at them. Evidently, they say now that out of 31 Abrams delivered to Ukraine, 20 has been uh, have been actually knocked out, I mean, burned, killed, you know, so uh, they try to now, uh, you know, hide all those challenges. Russians uh, uh, tell them just, you know, keep it go, uh, keep it you know coming and we will deal with this we would love to deal with this so as the result uh, here it is, you know, you see this guy, this is Russian guy, Lev Andropov, is from Armageddon, drunk dude with the dirty t-shirt in the dirty, clunky Russian space station in his Ushanka, you remember? So these are the dudes who do these things, you know, which uh, frankly Western militaries do not even know what to do what to talk and what to do about it. They just, you know, never experienced anything like this. And if you take a look at Taretsk today, as you can see yourself in red, actually, this is the actual advance uh, uh, today. Uh, this is from August 23 uh, of Russian forces. Uh, as you can see yourself, they are within uh, one kilometer of Taretsk center now. And Taretsk essentially is surrounded and it's operational envelopment. So that and, you know, it, it's going to fall. And uh, judging by the dynamics of the losses you see yourself, they are horrendous. Meanwhile, um, we have, uh, you know, the guys who, from economists, well, it's uh, uh, a little bit older, to, well, 12 days ago, article that America prepares for a new nuclear arms race. And economists, as you know, they don't publish names of people who write this uh, drudgery. And, uh, but, you know, so here they are. They talk about that its buildup could start as early as 2026. And this is what we need to keep in mind that uh, why it is important that obviously it's not going to happen. And I'm on record for many times now, and you can go out and read my blog, and, you know, I, I write about it all the time. Uh, it's that uh, there are all indications that, uh, well, I, let me quote myself, United States lost the arms race, and it's lost horrendously, by a mile. And uh, 
I don't think so that we will see any kind of the real rearmament anytime soon. If you look attentively at the two main uh, foundations, so to speak, of uh, uh, United States nuclear deterrence, which of course the Columbia class SSBN, strategic missile submarine, it might turn out to be a decent platform after all, because they will iron some of those kinks from it. But uh, obviously you have to keep in mind, it's been delayed a number of times and it's already over budget. In terms of Sentinel, intercontinental ballistic missile nobody knows what's going to happen with it. it it's just dramatically delayed and already something like 40 percent over budget so you can look it up i write about it all the time i cannot keep all those numbers in my head obviously but but there is another issue and here is what uh, has to be understood. All this it doesn't matter because in a delivery system, United States is not even competitor to Russia. It has nothing comparable to the already in the combat duty first line uh, RS-28 Sarman, and it has no strategic hypersonic weapons. It's not even close. So when you begin to look at it, sure, they will try to rearm. And I'm not saying that, uh, hey, in fact, is I'm the one, you know, strangely for some people that I will say United States needs nuclear deterrent. No doubt about it. I mean, it's the foundation of the national security. And yeah, but the work on this nuclear deterrent, my God, just to demonstrate to you, I'm not going to be commenting much on it, you know, but um, how to put it politely? Uh, I don't know how to, uh, what the hell, you know what, man, I have no words. Uh, they talk about um, uh, queer, uh, you know, uh, making a nuclear deterrent queer. So, and this is the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. It was 2023 article in which they, um, man, I don't, you know what, <laughs> yeah, make yourself, make your conclusions yourself, okay? So this is, was written uh, in June 15th, 2023, and uh, well, yeah, querying nuclear weapons. Yeah, you see, it's that's how it strengthens security and shapes disarmament. So, and just read it yourself, you know, I mean, uh, what can I say? Uh, yeah, just read it. I just will sit here and keep my mouth shut, you know. So when you read this whole thing, uh, you will understand why there are many doubts about that United States can produce anything of value anytime soon. But then, of course, even this thing already tells you something which is, uh, how to put it, uh, Ah, oh, gosh, I don't even know, you know, the, the, the United States Navy started to, you know, planning of removing even that's a thing that uh, sideline 17 support ships due to manpower issues. Military, and as you can see yourself, it was uh, two days ago, military salute command has drafted a plan to remove the crews from 17 Navy support ships due to a lack of qualified ma mariners to operate the vessels across the Navy. United States Naval Institute News learned there. Uh, so yeah it's just it's bad pretty much do you know what sea lift is it is essentially american uh sustainability of the proje power projection uh, well which uh, power projection stands a euphemism for uh bombing all kinds of defenseless people with impunity but still this and then suddenly how are you going to supply any kind of the troops if for example you decide to fight russia in the european uh, theater of operation well there there's your answer you have pretty much nothing to really operate it with and sustain the force and that explains to you the strategy of this whole uh, situation and that is why um I don't know, I, just in conclusion, I want to say, uh, Mr. Modi decided to play the uh, peacemaker, and hey, it's his right. Uh, it's, uh, India, India always, you know, moved on its own, but uh, I don't know why he went to Kiev and tried to mediate something which already have been completely de uh, declined many times, and Russian all officials from top, from Mr. Putin down to every single, you know, middle level uh, official, they speak openly. There will be no negotiations with Kyiv regime. Kyiv regime will cease to exist, as will the state of Ukraine. Simple as that. And it was the uh, anniversary of the Kursk battle, uh, the conclusion of the Kursk battle, which finally 
kind of uh, gave Russians a clear idea that there is nobody to talk about uh, anything in the West and in Ukraine. And so be it. And you know what? Well, we are subhumans, Russians, you know, so and yeah, that uh, basically uh, reflects itself in the f modern foreign policy of U Europe and United States. As simple as that. There's nobody to talk to, except for some, you know, there are a few exclusions, and there are some people, well, there's some strata of people who are decent, you know, people who understand what is going on. Majority of the public in the West, it pretty much follows the same pattern, and they have the same attitudes as their elites. So, and there you go. This is what I wanted to tell you today uh, about guys. And uh, what can I say? Uh, as always, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And uh, those who can afford, please support me on Patreon or buy me a coffee and two. I would really appreciate this. And, uh, you know, guys, have a nice weekend, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.